Yeah, we're reading there in Proverbs chapter 8, um, which is about wisdom and righteousness, which of course comes from the Lord. Um, like verse 7, For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. So this scripture is truth and wisdom, and those who seek such things, they will find righteousness. And something that also comes along with righteousness is judgment. Uh, verse 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. So the sermon tonight is about righteous hatred and people that God hates. And the title of the sermon is Righteously Hating Reprobates. So, you know, of course I'm speaking about reprobates or children of Belial as they are often referred to. Um, now they come in many different types. Um, so we'll be speaking about two of them tonight. But there is one thing that they all have in common, which we do find in Romans chapter 1. So we'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Um, and also to Leviticus chapter 20. Um, now some types of reprobates can be summed up as your false prophets and your false teachers, um, your infiltrators or your Judases. Um, there's those who receive the mark of the beast, those who blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Um, and these are all given over to a reprobate mind, as we're about to see in Romans chapter 1. But one thing they all have in common is that they hate God and reject His salvation. Um, so before we read that, we'll look down at Leviticus chapter 20, starting in verse 7. It says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman... Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and see she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his iniquity. And if a man shall lie with a woman having a sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain, and she hath uncovered the, the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor, nor of thy father's sister. For he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, and they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land whither I bring you dwell therein spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things and therefore I abhorred them. So God abhors not just the sin but the sinner also. And I know that's not what many out there believe but as Bible believing children of God you know especially in this Baptist church we believe that God's judgment is perfect and unquestionable. So we'll turn to Romans chapter 1 now, 
and we'll pick up in verse 16. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So how they got there is all the same. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God, and when they hated and rejected him, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. So following on from that in verse 24, these are the warning signs of such a person um, and what the end of them is. So we'll continue on. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause God gave them up under vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lusts, one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but a pleasure in them that do them. So what we need to understand is that those who have rejected God, they are filled with all these things. And these are your, psych- your psychopaths and your sodomites. Um, so we'll turn to Jude, and we'll start reading in verse 1. And this is also a parallel passage with Second Peter 2. We won't be going to Second Peter 2 tonight, but I... I do encourage you to actually uh, put them side by side and read them together. Um, but we'll start in verse 1 of Jude. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So Jude's writing to the brethren and he's about to warn them against reprobates. And you'll see the different types here. And then, that, though there's no clear ty- um, there's no clear line between these types, um, they are all capable of the same things. But some will show stronger traits than others. So, in verse three, it says, "Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares." who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, 
despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, while contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsayings of Cori. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So you'll find more references in Second Peter chapter 2, as well as Second Timothy chapter 3, which we will get to later. Um, but they also give a description of the false prophets and the infiltrators. And the point is that God hates them and has rejected them. And you have the example of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. It says they are to suffer eternal fire. Um, verse 4 speaks of your infiltrators or wolves, ungodly men pretending to be sheep and brothers in Christ. And verse 10 onwards speaks of the false prophet or the false teacher. Um, and what is their end? Um, you know, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? Um, so it says they are twice dead, whose fruit withereth and without fruit. So turn to Matthew chapter 7, because uh, uh, withered fruit and twice dead, these are things that actually Christ spoke about, um, and they are defined in the Gospels. Um, so we'll start in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Whereby, wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So you're seeing the pattern here. You know, God's done with these people and there's no redemption for them. Their judgment's already handed down, which is, you know, being cast into the fire. Um, so what does it mean to be twice dead? So we'll, we'll read from uh, Revelation chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. It says, verse 11 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And verse 12 in the same chapter, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So this is the judgment not just for those who die unsaved, but the reprobates already condemned to this judgment, to this second death. And that's why they're referred to as twice dead. Just like we become sons of God once we believe and are reborn, they are twice dead. They're the sons of Belial the moment they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. So once you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. Uh, and conversely, once you're condemned, you're condemned eternally. Um, God has reserved their place in the second death. The lake of fire has blotted out their name and their place from the book of life, which is where our names are written, having believed on the name of the Son of God. So the next point we'll see in Second Chronicles chapter 19. So we'll get you to turn there. And after that, we'll be heading to 2 Corinthians chapter 11.
So we see what God says about loving and helping these people. It says in verse 1, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now this is the king of Judah was helping out the king of Israel, who was a very wicked king at the time. Um, and the whole point was God was angry and the wrath was upon um, Jehoshaphat because he was helping the king of Israel. You know, and God saw that wickedness and said, look, if you're, if you're going to help him, you're partaking in the wickedness that he's doing. Um, we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1. But if we don't want the wrath of God upon us, then we shouldn't love God's enemies, nor the enemies of our faith. And as soul winners, we love the lost and hate the false prophet that goes before us teaching lies and deceiving the lost. So in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 11, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may pre present you as a chaste version to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So we should not bear with those who preach another gospel, that have another spirit or another Jesus, that's contrary to the one that we've received through the word of God. So in Galatians chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, uh, but you can turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2 if you like. I'll just read from verse 6 in Galatians chapter 1. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So it says it's not another gospel, but it's the perversion of the true gospel. And those who teach these damnable heresies, they're prophesying falsely. And they're the chaff whose end is to be burned. And here it says, let him be accursed. In Corinthians it said not to bear with him, which means don't receive him. So in 1 John chapter 2, we'll start in verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So it's the same thing as with Jehoshaphat, it's the same thing as with the churches in Corinth. You know, that if you bear with these people, you're actually partaking in the, their evil deeds. And that's why we're, we're to curse them and not to have fellowship with them, not to receive them in. Um... I'll get you to turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But here in 1 John, he, he says, don't even bid them Godspeed or bless them. So otherwise you're a partaker in the evil deeds that that person is committing. Um, so, and you see clearly how God feels about helping his enemies. And when it comes to those who are rejected of God and those preaching a false gospel, they're to be avoided and cursed and have no dealings with them. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Um, so in 1 Timothy, where you should be in chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, then consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, Supposing the gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. 
But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 49. But you know exactly who he's talking about here. You know, these are your Benny Hins, your Kenneth Copelands, your Creflo Dollars, Joel Osteen, and that disgusting Joyce Meyer. These are your false prophets speaking lies. And they're saying, thus saith the Lord. When they speak a false gospel, they have another Jesus and another spirit. They make merchandise of you and condemn you to hell when you believe their lies. So mark and avoid these devils and have no part in the wicked things they do. In Isaiah 49, we'll be starting in verse 20. It says, The children which thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the other, shall say again in thine ears, This place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me thee, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where had they been? Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people. They shall bring thy sons in their arms, and their daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. And I'll feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And of all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So we see that God loves his people and he hates those who contend with his people, causing them to sin and be oppressed. And those who treat us poorly, they're our enemies and we are commanded to treat them well. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. But there's no contradiction here. God is both the God of judgment, and there are people who hate God, and they are God's enemies. And when it comes to our enemies, it says we're to love them. But the reason why we love them, as we'll see in Romans chapter 12, it's to allow God to execute judgment and vengeance on our behalf, so that we don't take our own vengeance, but vengeance belongs to the Lord. So we'll turn to Romans chapter 12. So in verse 19 it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So make no mistake, our God is a God of vengeance. And we've seen more than enough of that through the book of Revelation, through the books of the Old Testament, that the judgment of God is just. And he is a God of righteous judgment. Um, and we do see more of that here in Isaiah chapter 42. So I'll get you to turn there. I'll read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer seeing is it a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, 
because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're doing the work of the Lord and others are troubling and persecuting you and you, you don't take vengeance on them yourself, says the Lord will recompense righteously upon them and he will take vengeance in his time. So we'll start in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 42. It says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor, ca- nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment into truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have said judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, that he created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth, that ye go down to the sea and all that it that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. And we'll, we'll turn down to, uh, to verse 17. It says, They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images. They say to the molten images, Ye are our gods. Hear ye deaf, and look, ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivereth. For a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger, and the strength of battle. And it hath set him on fire round about. Yet he knew not, and it burned him yet he laid it not to heart. So again, God's a God of judgment and of righteous vengeance. He's a jealous God, and many Israel's of, Israelites of the flesh who were not saved, um, they didn't believe on him and they made idols, and they were destroyed by the hand of God. And this is the God that the smooth-talking false prophets don't believe in. It's the God of the Bible that we do believe in. He's angry with the wicked, and we see more of that here in Proverbs chapter 6. So Proverbs 6, starting in verse 12, says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, and feet that are swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So as Jason preached last week, there is a wicked sin of bearing false witness or lying against another man, but there are also those who are the false teachers and false prophets, and the false witnesses of Christ. And that's what we're usually dealing with when we go soul winning. It's these false witnesses that are causing so many problems with us trying to get people saved. 
Um, so I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 57. I'll read to you from Proverbs chapter 11. It says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. They that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their ways are his delight. The hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. But you notice it says, you know, they that are of a froward heart, it doesn't say their heart's an abomination. It doesn't say that what they're doing is an abomination. It says they are an abomination to the Lord. We'll start in verse 1 of chapter uh, of Isaiah chapter 57. It says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. But draw not near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood, and flaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks? Among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They are, not, they are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou wast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice." And we'll go down to verse, uh, verse 12. It says, I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them, but he that putteth his, his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Uh, verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And this is a beautiful chapter. I suggest you read through it in its entirety as well at some point. Um, but it's what the Lord will do for those who put their trust in Him. But also showing that you can't have love without hate. So if you love your children, you're going to hate the people who are trying to hurt your children and so forth. Um, but it also says there's no rest for the wicked. It says they're troubled and they have no peace. So having established that God is a God of vengeance, and he's righteously angry. And he's just not some soft hippie that loves everyone and every wicked thing, which is what the false prophets would have you believe. Um, but let's go on to show what these people are like. So I'll read to you from Genesis chapter 6. I'll get you to turn to Genesis chapter 19. So in verse 5 of Genesis 6, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So in Genesis 6, he destroyed the world with a flood, because it was filled with violence, and the, the wickedness of men's hearts was evil continually. And in Genesis 19, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, um, chapter 18, if you haven't read it, it's a back and forth between Abraham and the Lord um, about you know who, how many righteous men are left in Sodom. Um, other than Lot, we're not told of any other men. Since he was the only one spared with his immediate family, we must conclude that they were the only ones who were actually believers and the rest were destroyed because they were not. Um, but keep in mind also that in Jude it said, that this is an example for us and for those who would live ungodly afterwards, that that judgment from God is the same judgment that he has today. So I'll just read to you again from Leviticus 
says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And also from Deuteronomy chapter 23, There shall be no whore of the daughter of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So in case you haven't been aware, sodomite is a biblical term for these people. And some other names used in the scripture to describe them, there's dogs or beasts or sons of the devil, children of Belial, um, workers of iniquity, And you'll find in the book of Kings that they often put the Sodomites out of the land. He's not talking about relocating them. He's talking about putting them to death. As you know, and Sodomites is a term used for these people all throughout the scriptures. So we start in verse 1 of Genesis 19. We're going to be reading through this whole story. Um, It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, unto your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And as Kevin's preached on, knowing is talking about um, they want, you know, basically to fornicate with them, they want to abuse them. Um, You know, these are disgusting, vile acts that these men are attempting to do. Um, it says, A lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again. Then one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. So again, you can see here, there's both old and young here. Um, But also you remember, it talks about in Romans chapter 1, how they're unmerciful and implacable. And these are men of violence who are looking to violate you. Verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any here besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, and the angels hastened, Lot said, Arise, take thy wife. Hasten, Lot, sorry, saying, Arise, take thy wife and two daughters, which are here, lest ye be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto and is a little one, O oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. 
So haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So, I mean, even, even Lot pushed his luck by living amongst the Sodomites. And even he didn't want to leave. Um, he was dragged out of there by the angels. Um, but it was for Abraham's sake, who was his uncle, um, that he was even spared. But it is pretty damning in itself, just that story. What absolute wickedness we see in the hearts of these people. And it's not just a sexual preference as the world would have you believe. But they, they are filled with violence, as we read in Romans chapter 1. They not only have vile affections in their heart, but they want to violate you and your children. And this is the reality of the Sodomite. It's also not the, it's not the only example we have either. And Judges 19 has a very similar story. So we'll start there also. We'll be reading through uh, Judges 19 and Judges 20. <coughs> It says, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. So there's something right there, you know. There's no one to actually judge righteously in the land. And these Sodomites are just everywhere. Um, it says, and there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And so she brought him into her father's house. When the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days, so that he'd eat and drink and lodge there. And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down and did eat and drink both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray ye, and tarry all night. Let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. And he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon. And they did eat both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold now, the day draweth toward evening. I pray you, tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here that thine heart may be merry, and tomorrow get you early on your way, that you mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And then when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And he said unto his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were at Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. So it belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. They turned aside thither to go in and lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodge in. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the uh, in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? He said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. For thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but, now, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. There is no man that receiveth me to house. 
Yet there's both straw and provender for our asses. There is bread and wine also for me, for the handmaid. For the young man which is with thy servants, there is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So it's the same situation here with the angels. They were going to lodge in the street to see what Sodom was really like. Um, this man's in Gibeah in, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, he also is going to lodge in the street. But this city is also full of Sodomites. And he knows how this, this man that lives there knows how dangerous it is. And he's pleading with them, don't lodge in the street because you never know what's going to happen to you because they're all men of violence. It says... So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth that man that came into thine house, that we may know him. So again, you see their intention is very clear. You know, these men are filthy and disgusting, but... It calls them, this time, not men of Sodom, but it calls them sons of Belial, you know, children of the devil. Um, you know, so that's why we call them the same. It says, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter a maiden and his concubine, them I will bring out now, and humble you them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do, do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was, till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass. The man rose up and get him unto his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And, it's, and it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed d done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. I mean, that's a horrific story. Just right there, just reading that story alone should be enough for you to flee from these wicked people, these wick wicked Sodomite reprobates. And just look what God calls it. He calls them the sons of Belial. You know, that these are twice dead whose end is to be burned. And after reading what they're capable of, are you really going to defend them to me? You know, does your heart actually bleed for these monsters? I hope not. You know, these are the most vile and disgusting beasts on this earth. And make no mistake, they will harm you and they will harm those you love. So we'll also read now the judgment that Israel had for these reprobates in chapter 20. It says, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, ye are all children of Israel, Give here your advice and counsel. So I like this. Israel is being asked to judge the wickedness. Um, you know, and we also have the luxury of knowing what God's judgment is because we have the complete, perfect word of God. So we can apply God's judgment because we know what he expects. And this is one of the times they actually did right. It says, And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. 
But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. We'll take ten men of a hundred through all the tribes of Israel, and a an hundred of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to fetch, fetch victuals for the people that they may do. They come to Gibeah of Benjamin, Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. I like that it says that they were knit together as one man gathered against the city. And when it comes to these things, we should also be knit together in judgment against the things that God's already judged. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And we had that as a memory verse as Kevin was going through um, through the book of Corinthians. And that one also stuck with me. Um, we'll continue verse 12 in, uh, in Judges chapter 20. It says, And the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities under Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. So we also have a back and forth here between some of the tribes are going up against Benjamin and they're being slain. Um, They're they're checking with the Lord to see who's going to go up next. Um, But then we get to the the last time... Um, Where are we? Verse 27. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. So again, this is not just Israel's judgment, but the Lord's judgment on these wicked people. And Israel set liars in wait round about Gibeah. The children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day, put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And basically, um, they end up winning because uh, they draw them out, um, they turn around, they see their cities on fire, um, and they burn it to the ground, and they kill everyone in the city. And, uh, And we'll pick up in verse 40 says, but when the flame began to arise out of the city with a sm- pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw that evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and them which came out of the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And their fellow Benjamin, 18,000 men, all these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Rimmon. And they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men and pursued hard after them unto Gidom and slew 2,000 men of them. So that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness under the rock Rimmon and abode in the rock Rimmon four months. And the men of Israel turned again to the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast and all that came to hand. And they set fire all the cities that they came to. And this could easily have been avoided had they just produced the reprobate sodomites as they were asked to do. But rather than do that, they said, no, we want to keep those people. And God said, fine, then I'm going to destroy, you know, it almost destroyed the entire tribe of Benjamin. And we see in the New Testament that we're also not to yoke up with them or to have anything to do with them. They're to be marked, avoided, and cursed. And it's unfortunate I've had an experience with such a person. I was at a Pentecostal church here on the Sunshine Coast. Um, And they protected him because he was a relative of, of some of the pastors there. And he was convicted multiple times of uh, offending children and even murdering children. And yet he was still allowed in this church around children and, and around us. Um, and to nobody's surprise, he murdered again and he sexually abused 
a 10-year-old boy while he was at that church, just meters from the church, you know, and he's in prison now, but he deserves to be put to death. He should have been put to death a long time ago, and he wouldn't have been able to offend these children. I like what uh, Christ says in Matthew 18, 5. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And that's why I'm so angry with churches that allow these reprobates you know, to come in with them. How much must you hate God's people to allow the children of the devil to reside with them? And every reprobate has the potential for this. All sodomites are reprobates, but not all reprobates are necessarily sodomites. But they're always degenerate in their lusts. That's why you see so many false teachers and false prophets. You know, they're involved with adultery, multiple marriages, with sometimes with young girls or young boys. You know, they just can't help themselves. They're all children of Belial. They're sons of the devil. Um, and their father is the devil, as Christ says to the Pharisees. So we covered lying prophets and false teachers a bit earlier, but there's also one more thing, one more thing that I have to speak about. It's something God hates, and it's, it's something I hate as well. And it's speaking deceitfully for the Lord, putting words in your mouth and proclaiming God has spoken when he has not spoken. And this is something that's big in the charismatic and the Pentecostal churches. But I've also seen it creeping in the Baptists as well. So Jason did really well. He covered Ezekiel 13 last week. Um, We're going to read a few verses from that chapter again. So we'll turn to Ezekiel 13. In verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? Have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity, and the divine lies, they shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall, and there shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. And this is something that these Pentecostals, of course, that most of them are unsaved, but they just don't understand. You know, they're all about the positivity and the word of knowledge must be positive and must be edifying. Um, and these are the rules they have on prophesying. But when you read through the prophets who prophesied good things all the time, they were not the ones who were sent by God. And it says that God was against them. And they are the lying false prophets. The true prophets were speaking the hard things. They're your Jeremiah's, your Ezekiel's, you know, your Isaiah's. We have, we have their words and the Lord says that I spoke to them. And the false teachers are saying peace, but the Lord is saying that it will fall and be destroyed. You know, it's like this lying devil, Joyce Meyer, in her book, God is not mad at you. You know, guess what, Joyce? God is mad at you. You know, in fact, his wrath is upon you, dressing like a man. God says that all that do so are abomination unto the Lord. Those that prophesy falsely, the Lord hates. Those that usurp authority over the man are dishonoring God. Everything she does is abomination to the Lord. So yes, God is mad at you and he's angry with the wicked every day. We turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. I mean, if you haven't figured out that I hate Pentecostalism yet, <laughs> you soon will. We'll start in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim thee this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at the gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods in your, to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense under Baal, and walk after other gods whom you knew not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And so those who might not believe that God's just as angry today as he was back then, um, the lying prophets and abominations found within the church, here it's in the temple, but Jesus made a similar, um, similar statement when he's chasing the merchants out of the temple as well in the Gospels. Um, he said that they'd made it into a den of thieves, like Israel had made it in the temple uh, a den of robbers. He then goes on to say not to pray for these people in verse 16. Therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. And what were the things that were making the Lord so wrath with them? If you read through chapter 7 on your own, you'll see the theft, murder, adultery, lying, worshipping Baal, sacrificing their children through the fire. And again, if you think that's changed, you believe that God's not angry about that, then let's turn to Revelation chapter 9 and we'll actually see that this is still a problem even in the future. <clears throat> so Revelation chapter 9 is God's wrath is being poured out on the earth and this is what it has to say in verse 20 and 21. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So Israel was like this, and the world in the future is going to be like this, and it even is today. But why is that? It's because they rejected the prophets of God, and they embraced the false prophets. And that's how you end up with the wrath of God upon you. So we're not going to read Second Peter chapter 2, but as I said before, I do recommend reading it with Jude side by side. Um, but I will get you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 22 and I'll read from Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember, that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you, night and day with tears. And it's always the same motivation with these guys. They want to draw you away. They want, to, they want you to believe their false doctrine. They want you to, to worship other gods. They want you to commit sin. And sometimes they're just after your money. And Ezekiel 22, we'll start in verse, verse 22. It says, As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets, and I love that term, the conspiracy of the prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and the precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken." The people of the land have used oppression, exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And it's interesting, this, this is very similar wording also to uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. 
again, two different authors. Um, but I mean, Israel was up to the same tricks for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you know, are these false prophets conspiring against the men to destroy them? And that's why I believe that saying, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord said to me, and putting words in God's mouth, is blaspheming and profaning his name. Um, his name to us is precious. And the words the Lord has spoken in the scripture, for us in English, that's the King James Bible, we have the complete, perfect word of God. And if you're quoting from the scriptures, by all means say, the Lord says, and quote from the scriptures. Because the Lord truly did say. But I think it's dangerous to proclaim the words of God in any other circumstances. And I'm not saying if you do this, you're a reprobate, but this is what these reprobate false teachers do. And we want nothing to do with them. We don't even want to have the appearance of evil. So we should have nothing to do with this and not be associated with it. And God doesn't take it lightly. When it comes to his name, his name is holy, his name is right, his name is precious. And we should feel the same way about it. I'll read to you from Hebrews 1, verse 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So in time past, he spoke to the men through the prophets, and now he's spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, and the witnesses that were there with him. And guess what? We have the same words by the same prophets. It's in the Scriptures. And there is no new prophecy today. The Scripture is finished. We have the totality of God's Word in the King James Bible. And this is what Peter is also teaching in 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll read to you from verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and when we, when we were with him in the holy mount, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn as a day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Uh, sorry. Uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So even though Peter witnessed the transfiguration and glory of Jesus Christ, and he heard that voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, Peter's response to that is, well, we have a more short word of prophecy. We have the scriptures now, these are written by the Holy Ghost. They're written by the Old Testament prophets. They're written by the New Testament authors and apostles and the witnesses of Jesus Christ. So I'll get you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll read to you from, uh, from Job and Proverbs. In Job 13, it says, Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you accept his person? Will you contend for God? So we should not speak wickedly for God and put words in his mouth and speak deceitfully on his behalf. When we say, thus saith the Lord, you know, we better be sure that the Lord actually said that. Otherwise, we're putting words in his mouth. In Proverbs 30, he says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So we'll... Uh, Read Second Timothy verse three, uh, sorry, chapter three, verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And I have not been in a Pentecostal church that doesn't describe this to a T. I mean, they are, they are full of these things, but they also have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. And, but this is, this is specifically talking about reprobates. It's the same language as used in Romans chapter 1. These are your false prophets, your lying teachers, 
people who have, you know, teachers that teach you smooth things, and they, they want your money, they want you to chase after the, their lies, but they don't want you anywhere near the truth. They hate God. And this is, it's, it, this is what it says about them. You know, for this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, in all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So Paul's warning Timothy, who's, who's a pastor, about deceivers and wolves who will infiltrate his church. Um, and that he needs to keep the things he's learned and been assured of by the good men of God that he's learned them from, such as Paul. While also keeping the same thing in mind for the sheep that he's responsible for, it's also very important who you choose to learn from. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 14. But this is something we all have to watch out for. They are going to come in because they're going to be attracted to churches like ours. You know, we're hard-working, gospel-preaching churches that go out soul-winning. Verse 14 in Jeremiah 14 says, Then the Lord said unto me, That the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. So again, it's talking about how these come, it's their own vain imaginations. They come from within their own heart. These, uh, these divinations, these visions and dreams that they prophesy, which is not of God. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. They shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. So again, they're preaching good things, but is it the truth or are they lying prophets? You know, what was the true prophet of God preaching? Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse 32. Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And when this people, or the prophet or a priest, shall say thee, saying, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt, say, thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Thus shall ye every one, ye say every one to his neighbour, and every one to his brother, What hath the Lord answered, and what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee, and what hath the Lord spoken? But since that ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, I have sent unto you, saying, You shall not say the burden of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, 
and the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence, I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. So, I mean, do I even need to go on? Um, does it, doesn't that just condemn the light words of these false prophets who prophesy lies and deceive God's people? You know, and this, this does include the repenting of sins crowd, the baptismal re- regeneration crowd, you know, and anyone else who's teaching another gospel has another spirit or another Jesus. And we have to fight hard against these devils as we go out and do the work knocking doors and preaching the gospel to the lost. So we're getting to the conclusion now. Um, we'll just turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, it says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. If thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fellow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that no one can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. Jeremiah 5, verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the, city, through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I read from verse 10. Go ye upon her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he. Neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. And the prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Because ye speak this word, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. So again, what's, what's the true prophet preaching? He's preaching destruction on Israel. And yet all the, all the false prophets are all preaching love and peace, and you know, everyone's saying kumbaya, it's just garbage. In verse 22, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence, which shall place the sand for the band of the sea by a perpetual decree? that it cannot pass, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He re- reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait, and he that setteth snares, they set a trap and catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat and shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit you for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? The wonderful and horrible thing is committed in this land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? So it's popular. It's always popular to lie, to deceive, you know, to be a false prophet. It's popular. That's why the Joel Osteens and that are so popular. <clears throat> because people love being lied to. Even if it's just telling them, you've got, just got to repent of your sins. It's not a free gift. They love that. They seem to love that more than the gift itself. But after these beginning chapters in Jeremiah, the first five chapters are very much like that. Um, we, get to the, uh, we get to the end of chapter 6 in Jeremiah, starting in verse 26. It says, O daughter of my people, 
gird thee with sackcloth, and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning, as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corrupters. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Is verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So do you see what you end up with when you've got false prophets undermining the true prophets? You know, you end up with a nation or even a church full of reprobates who reject the truth and believe a lie. And they hate God and they want to deceive you and lead you away from the one true God and to cause you to worship other gods and commit sin. So yoking with these people and having compassion on them is actually mocking God because you're saying that you're more loving than him. Um, And he's already given up on them. Psalm 97 verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. And there's no people filled with more evil than these children of the devil. The Lord has rejected them, and so should we. Uh, Jason, do you mind praying?